And again, this is your official welcome to the White House Caribbean American Heritage Month briefing. Uh, we're really excited to have you all in the room and really look forward to um, discussing a lot of the issues that we have on the agenda today. Um, we are going to start with Urim 7, which is a music group of, of young Caribbean Americans. They're going to lead us off with the national anthem and one more piece, and then we'll go ahead and get started um, with the program. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand for the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly Till big 
victory is won. Move on. Move on. Yeah, yeah. Move on. Move on. Tell somebody, move on. Move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Move on. Move on. Got to keep on moving. Move on. Move on. Move on. Move on. Yeah. March on, move on, let us march on, move on, let us march on till victory. So the song that we're about to do, it's an original with a little twist. It's called Freedom Chant, and we are going to do, ex we infused it with the Exodus song by Bob Marley. We want to be free as a Christ from Galilee. Our enemies flee for its jubilee. Yeah. We want to be free from captivity. Praise God, it's liberty. Leaving is a must. Says Leviticus, make no fuss, for it's Exodus. Living is a must. Uh, make no fuss, uh, it's Exodus. Come on, come on, come on, come on now. Come on, 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 come it's the truth that he knew. While Goliath, he slow. We are the real Hebrews, the chosen few, the inward Jews. Charting the king's highway, highway. is the iron man's way. Oh, ancient of days. You never lead us astray. Charting the king's highway, highway is the higher man's way. Oh, ancient of days, you never lead us astray. Come out, come out, come out. Exodus. Hey, Lord, yeah. Movement of your people. Whoa, 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 whoa. Exodus. Yeah, no. Movement of your people. Exodus. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the White House. 
Uh, my name is Ashley Allison. I'm the Deputy Director in the Office of Public Engagement. We're so excited to have you all here. Uh, you all, the music group out you all were wonderful as they exit. Um, we can give them another round of applause. It's always good to see uh, young people when I came in and they were singing the Black National Anthem. Um, it was good to hear that. It's been a, a, a tough week in our country. So it was really inspiring and uplifting to hear so many young, see uh, young people here and be a part of the program. Um, we are really excited to have you here today. I know there is a reception upstairs that you all will be participating in after. You have a wonderful program put together. Kalisha, who just ducked behind. Kalisha, wave your hand. She's been working extremely hard. Um, she's in intergovernmental affairs to put to, together a full program so you can hear all about the president's uh, initiatives and priorities and also have an opportunity to have a conversation. So just a couple housekeeping uh, manners. I see a lot of cameras up and we love for people to take photos and promote that they are here at the White House. But this meeting, like all of our meetings, is off the record and not intended for press purposes. So you can tweet, you can Facebook, you can say that you were here for this event. But what you can't do is say that Ashley Allison said this at the event or if one of our panelists said that. Um, when you all came in, you all received a badge. Just make sure so that you have a, a pleasurable experience here that you keep your badge displayed at all times. If you have a pink badge, make sure that someone who is on staff here walks you to the restroom or if you need to go grab a soda or something like that, just you'll need an escort um, and we don't want you to get stopped in the halls. For ladies, if you need to go to the restroom, you come out for men as well, you'll go out the same way you uh, came. For women, you'll make a right, and then you'll walk to the tables and make another right, and the bathroom will be on your left. For men, you'll make a left, and your bathroom will be on your right. So if you don't remember that, you can ask anyone here on staff. Um, but we're really excited to have you here. Heather Foster, I'm standing in her place today. Many of you probably know her. Um, she is uh, sadly traveling to Charleston right now to, to help with that. Um, trip for the president, but she is saddened that she cannot be here. She is of Jamaican descent, and she was working extremely hard to make sure you have an enjoyable time here. So she sends her regrets that she can't be here, but also a warm hello. Um, so I won't stand in before you any longer. I will turn it over to our immigration panel. One of um, my colleagues in the Office of Public Engagement will be moderating that panel. So Janae Manganya. Hello and good afternoon. Well, this was such a beautiful opening uh, with just uh, such a warm, kind feeling to, um, so thank you again for being here. Uh, again, as Ashley mentioned, my name is Janae Magana. I am the Immigration and Latino Engagement Liaison here for the White House. So I'm very excited to be here with you today. Uh, along with me today, uh, I have Felicia Escobar, who is the Special Assistant to the President for Immigration Policy. And she's gonna be giving us an update on where the administration is on immigration policy, along with Fatima Noor, uh, who's the Policy Analyst for Immigration and Rural Affairs. And she's gonna be giving us an update on World Refugee uh, Champions of Change program that we have coming up here soon. Um, before we get started, I just wanna let you know that uh, we're gonna start off by giving you a little bit of background on what we do in, in our jobs here on a daily basis, and then really jump into a little bit more of uh, some of the policy issues. So I'm going to turn it over to Felicia to get us started. Um, and Felicia, will you tell us a little bit what your daily life is like here, what you do for the president, uh, and then start us off with an update on immigration. Great, thank you, Janae, um, and thank you all for being here. It's great to um, to see so many um, bright and happy faces. Uh, I know we're at the beginning of the program too, which is nice. Uh, so you're still uh, happy and uh, comfortable in your seats. Um, so again, my name is Felicia Escobar. Uh, I work uh, here at the White House Domestic Policy Council. I think you will be hearing from a number of my colleagues throughout the afternoon from the Domestic Policy Council. Um, what we do uh, at DPC, there's, there's three policy councils in the White House. One that deals with economic issues, so the National Economic um, Council. Uh, one that deals with foreign policy and security issues, the National Security Council. And then DPC, which does pretty much everything else, anything from healthcare, um, housing, uh, energy issues. 
um, and, 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 and immigration issues. So at, the, uh, at DPC, I run our immigration policy team. Uh, and what um, that means is that every day we're working with uh, stakeholders, we're working with folks on Capitol Hill, we're working with agencies to make sure that we're doing all we can uh, to make the system work better. Um, I think you all probably know that we're, we're really dealing with a broken law that needs to be fixed. Um, and so uh, one really important part of our job is continuing to push Congress uh, to think about reforming our immigration system. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we still have to run the government and we still have to work with, this, with the system that we have. And so that means that uh, we're on a daily basis talking to the various agencies that are the key players in the immigration system, and there are many uh, agencies. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security is, also, is all obviously the primary agency that helps process immigration applications and so uh, we're always talking to them about a variety of things, family-based immigration petitions, employment-based um, green card petitions or um, temporary worker programs, citizenship and naturalization, um, work related to the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, uh, always trying to talk to them about how they can improve their services and make sure that we're really serving the public the way we need to. Um, there's also the Department of State, which is um, if anyone is trying to travel um, from overseas, that's an agency that you have to go through in order to get your, your green card, to get your visa, um, to come to the country. So there's a lot of conversations with them as well. And then uh, a variety of other, of other agencies, the Department of Justice runs our immigration court system. The Department of Labor also plays a role in making sure that all workers are protected um, if in, in the workplace, including immigrant workers, um, but also making sure that if we're bringing people from overseas to work in our country, that they're not displacing American workers. So they uh, play a role in, in some of the temporary worker programs. So lots of conversations with the agencies. Um, again, as I mentioned, a lot of conversations with Capitol Hill. Um, we were particularly engaged with them uh, in 2013 and 2014 when we, were, when we finally had a group of bipartisan leaders in the Senate that were willing to pass, uh, to consider and to, and to uh, pursue immigration reform legislation. We worked with um, many of um, the bipartisan group that worked on legislation to pass something out of the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get that over the finish line last Congress. Um, <clears throat> and so as a result, the president uh, made the decision that um, he could really wait no longer. Um, I've been with him since August of 2009. Uh, so we have been pushing for immigration reform legislation since the beginning of his term. Uh, we, uh, in the first couple years, were looking for people that could actually work with us and we couldn't find partners, um, particularly on the Republican side of the aisle that were willing to work with us. Um, but that's why we were, that, and that's why we were so encouraged in 2012 when we really did have people that seemed, after the elections, uh, to seem interested in working with us. And unfortunately, uh, while we were able to get something out of the Senate, we couldn't get something out of the House. So um, the president last summer, right around this time actually, uh, made a decision that he would um, wait no longer and uh, wanted to see what we could do to, ma to make the system work better within the confines of the existing law. And so um, that resulted in. Uh, an, in an announcement that he made last November, um, a package of immigration um, executive actions, um, which included uh, expanding the DACA program uh, for um, Dreamers, so the program that allows young people uh, to um, to come forward and apply for temporary relief from removal and also uh, work permits, um, and then we also. Um, uh, announced that we would create another program for parents of U.S. citizens and green card holders who had been here for a certain number of years and had met a number of different uh, requirements. Um, that program is called the DAPA program. Both the DACA expansion and the DAPA program are currently on hold right now as we um, as we are involved in litigation uh, in, in uh, Texas and in the Fifth Circuit. Um, at this point, we're not able to implement those programs. Uh, but there still is the DACA 2012 program, and we're um, there are about 650,000 people who have actually um, been able to uh, come forward and get uh, DACA through the 2012 policy, uh, including people um, from Caribbean countries. Um, there are kind of a list on, on USCIS's website of people from different states uh, and different um, countries of origin. Um, and you would see countries like Jamaica and others um, on that list of people who have been able to come forward. Uh, it's, it's, some, it's a program that's really changed people's lives. Um, you know, young people who are, want to get their education and want to use their education are finally able to do that, uh, which is why we want to uh, make sure that we eventually are able to implement the DAPA program. And um, we are very confident that 
when uh, when all the, the litigation is is all said and done, that we will prevail. Um, so it's something we continue to be involved in. But in addition to that, there are a number of other pieces of the immigration puzzle we're trying to fix as a part of the immigration executive actions. Um, we are working on immigration enforcement policy, which is always a struggle and a difficult issue, trying to make sure that DHS is prioritizing the right people, people who are real public safety threats, national security threats, not folks that are really just trying to make a life here. And so there were some new enforcement priorities that DHS put out, um, and they are busy uh, implementing those priorities and making sure that, um, in particular, that their law enforcement officials across the, um, the country are implementing them uh, in a consistent way. We don't, want to we don't want, you know, Atlanta doing one thing, New York doing another thing, LA doing something else. We want to make sure that those are being implemented in the right way, which is why, you know, conversations like this, smaller and bigger uh, conversations are important for us to have to make sure that we're getting feedback on how uh, implementation is going. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, there are some legal immigration regulations that we're pursuing. Uh, we also have um, uh, established a White House Task Force on New Americans, which is very much focused on the 40 million uh, people who were foreign born in our country. Um, obviously, we care about the undocumented that is a part of that community, but there's a lot of other people, right, that are foreign born, and we want to make sure that they're getting integrated into their communities, that, um, that there are welcoming communities that they can be a part of, that um, if they qualify for citizenship, that they know about the process and um, hopefully making the decision to apply. Uh, if they need to learn English, that they have classes available to them. Uh, and if they wanna start um, businesses or move up and get more skills, um, maybe they come here with skills as doctors but can't um, actually use those skills here. We wanna make sure that we um, create opportunities for them to do that. So the White House Task Force is um, an 18 member um, uh, entity that is includes DHS, um, State Department, but also people like the Department of Labor and the Department of Education and Health and Human Services. We are all trying to work together to come up with um, federal strategies that can support state and local efforts uh, around immigrant integration, uh, immigrant and refugee integration issues. So that's a little bit about uh, what we do. Um, it's a lot. It keeps us uh, keeps us up late and, and up, and we have to wake up early. Um, but um, I'll also let Fatima talk a little bit about an, a special event we're doing tomorrow. Thank you, Felicia. Um, so uh, I will just uh, uh, give a brief description of also what I do, uh, working closely with Felicia on some of the efforts um, that Felicia just mentioned. mentioned. Um, we are all working on immigration issues and making sure that we're moving forward the president's um, agenda on immigration and also uh, working co uh, closely on the White House Task Force for new, uh, on New Americans and making sure the implementation efforts on that are also moving forward and engaging stakeholders and doing outreach events uh, accordingly. And Another exciting event that I also want to talk about is um, tomorrow we'll be hosting an event here at the White House in this very room um, um, commemorating uh, World Refugee Day. Um, as many of you know, World Refugee Day is celebrated around the world on June 20th. Um, civil society uh, members uh, of NGOs and uh, all across um, different governments uh, celebrate um, refugees and also lift up stories of uh, refugees who are doing amazing work in their communities. Um, in order um, to do that here at the White House, we are um, collaborating uh, closely with Office of Public Engagement on a program called the White House um, Champions of Change event. The White House Champions of, uh, White House Champions of Change uh, program is a program designed to uh, lift up the stories of um, Americans who are doing great work in um, their communities um, and who, who, can, can, who can then come here and inspire others to do uh, what, uh, with, with the, work, the work that they're doing and the space that they're working on. Um, so we um, did a call for nominations um, for uh, soliciting um, nominations for refugees, former refugees, and also refugee service providers who are working closely on protection and assistance, uh, um, humanitarian assistance abroad, but also um, ensuring the integration and reception of refugees here when they come here. Um, as many of you know, refugees face many challenges when they come from um, a, uh, from their home countries and, and resettle. I myself went through that settlement process when I came to this country 10 years ago. So it's something that's very close to my heart and I know um, those challenges. And it was uh, amazing um, to be part of, uh, of this, um, uh, 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 these efforts. So to give you uh, a description of uh, the event itself tomorrow, it'll be uh, 
uh, live streamed um, at 1.40 um, p.m. Um, tomorrow, and it will feature opening remarks by Ambassador Susan Rice, um, a national security uh, advisor to the president. And we'll then have a panel of 10 champions who are um, leaders in refugee uh, protection overseas and uh, humanitarian assistance, and who can also then speak to their own personal experiences, either being refugees um, overseas and also um, the, the challenges that refugees um, face and also the great work that they're doing. And then we'll also have uh, a domestic panel focused on integration efforts who will build upon the work that Felicia just mentioned on building uh, welcoming communities um, as outlined in the task force on uh, New Americans. Uh, we'll also have speakers um, including um, the Director of Domestic Policy Council, Cecilia Munoz, and also um, Ambassador uh, Samantha Powers, our representative to the United Nations. Um, the, the event will highlight um, also the work that, the importance of, um, the, the challenges that refugees face, and also the importance of um, assisting uh, refugees in, in highlighting uh, some of the great work that um, our refugees uh, are um, doing and celebrating um, the efforts that they're engaged in. And Fatima, if they want to watch that live stream, is it at the whitehouse.gov? Yes, yeah, so it will be at whitehouse.gov uh, forward slash live. And you can also follow the conversation on Twitter and social media um, using the hashtag, um, hashtag WH uh, champions. Thank you so much, Fatima. Just out of curiosity, how many folks here have gone to uh, whitehouse.gov? Okay, great. Um, well, I'd really encourage you to, to you know, keep up to date. And make sure you, you get a chance. We constantly have live stream events on there. One of the things I'd like to mention too. So, so this month, along with Caribbean Heritage Month, we've been cele celebrating Immigrant Heritage Month across the the month, celebrating all the different cultures, all the different people, especially those two that make up the administration. Um, just recently, a couple weeks ago, we had a beautiful story by Fatima and and her refugee story. And it, I encourage you get a chance if you get a chance go to whitehouse.gov uh, slash blog uh, and it's posted up there um, but this month uh, it's been really exciting for me so first of all again my name is Janae Magana I'm the associate director with the Office of Public Engagement uh, with the being the liaison to the immigration and Latino community and one of my favorite parts of my job is that I get to help share stories, right? I get to talk to our stakeholders, talk to groups such as yourselves um, and really find out what what it means to you, what it means, what this heritage means to you, and how we can share that story and get it out there for others uh, to hear it as well. At the beginning of this month, we started sharing stories just within our staff, and, and that quickly built up. Everybody started to remember the stories from either their grandparents or their father or their mother, or maybe that they, um, they felt something very strongly themselves. But it was very beautiful, and we, we had a chance to really get to hear from across the board. And, and this is something that I, I'm going to encourage you to walk out of this room with. I want you to really take this month and make sure that you're sharing your story. Make sure that you're talking about your heritage, not just with your family, but with friends and coworkers and whoever it may be. Uh, because something that seems so small to you really does stick in people's minds. You know, whether it was. Um, something that reminds you uh, of your grandparents or your mother or your father. It's, it's something that we have to really keep these stories going. Um, so in the Office of Public Engagement, part of my job is, is to work with, with the stakeholders, to work with groups, to really engage the community and find ways that we're not just you know, getting the information out there regarding immigration policy, but we're listening to you as well. We're listening to figure out what is important to you and how can the president uh, throughout the end of his administration continue to work for the people and continue to make a difference. So it, it really is a great honor. And this past month, again, as I mentioned, that we've been celebrating uh, Caribbean Heritage and Immigrant Heritage Month, it, it's been a, a wonderful time to, to mobilize communities and to get them more involved. Um, 
If you are on Facebook or on Twitter, one easy way you can do this is by posting a photo of your family, by posting something that maybe is memorable to you. I, one of my friends posted a picture of food because that's what her heritage meant to her. Um, and, and just uh, get the story out there, share it with somebody. It really is important. And so really right now, I would just love to open it up to hear from you and to take any questions, whether it be specifically on policy or on the engagement piece. Um, we'd love to hear directly from you. Do we have any questions? Yes. Well, I, I think you're doing um, the first thing right is standing up and, and voicing that right now. I, I think that that's critical and to bring it to my attention as well. Um, there's 18 months left of the administration. And I'll tell you this little story. On my computer desk, there's a little sticky note that says every day counts. And it does. Every single day counts. So perhaps something has been slow to move, but we want to continue to move things in the right direction. And I know the president is trying every which way he can on immigration. Um, I, I don't know if, if Felicia has some comments on this, but um, I would say too, uh, first, you brought it up. Second, you and I should talk after this too as well and continue the conversation. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Felicia to see if she has some additional thoughts. Sure. So, um, you know, on the immigration reform debate, I mean, so I've been working on this for 15 years. I worked on the 06 and 07 debates in the Senate, and then I worked on the 2013 debates here at the White House. Um, and I, before that, I was an advocate outside of government and, and worked on, on these issues as well at the state level. Um, it, you know, I think it's the fact that you continue to have the energy and you continue to want to push um, is important. And I think that we need to continue to hold um, you know, our leaders accountable. I mean, the president will continue to push for immigration reform legislation, and if people, I mean, he said to Congress, if you don't like DACA or DAPA, pro you know, propose a bill, uh, work with me, let's try to get something passed, and we'll continue to be open to that. Um, uh, and I think it's it's important for you all to also be talking to your elected officials in Congress um, to remind them that this continues to be on your agenda um, because that's something that people don't, you know, we don't want people to just think, oh, well, it's only important one year, not the next year. Um, you know, I would hope the Champions of Change event uh, is a legacy that, that the next administration keeps, uh, keeps up. And I think people talking about how positive it is and how important it is helps. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, and then on the task force and new Americans, I mean, one of the reasons why we wanted to create a formal interagency, and it actually was created through presidential memoranda, um, uh, was to institutionalize it. And we're working a lot 
with agencies, not just the political appointees like us that will be gone in, a, in 18 months, but also with the career staff uh, so that they really get bought into it, and, and they really are, um, so that when we're gone, they can encourage the, the next administration, um, whatever party, uh, to continue those efforts, so. Thank you, let's see over here. Oh, oh sorry. And we're not quite sure why. Um, there, in the, in the past 10 years, the Bahamas has pre-clearance, which means you clear uh, immigration uh, and Customs and Border Patrol in the country if you come through Nassau or Freeport. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past 10 years, the number of visas, uh, visa denials, have doubled. In fact, the, the number of visa denials uh, are the same as they are with Japan as far as percentages go. And the Bahamas has always had a beautiful relationship with America, whereas Japan was at one time an enemy. So I, I, that is a little confusing because um, the reasons that they're giving a lot of the times are the same. They give a generic denial under subsection 214B, which just means you don't have sufficient but they're doing that so that they can't chat, so that the individuals can't challenge what the uh, the basis of the denial is. Because if it's wrapped around that provision, they can't challenge it because the State Department has absolute, the officers there have absolute control over that. Mm -hmm. So that's one issue that I want to bring to the attention to see if we can get that issue at least looked at because I've tried through the legal um, advisory um, Division Legal Net, mm -hmm. and because there's a 214B attached, they can't review it. Uh, and I actually attended a conference in April to try and get that out there, but I wasn't really effective in doing that. So I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to death to be here today uh, to talk to the people that actually can pass that information on. And then the other issue concerns um, Customs and Border Patrol, at, uh, which falls under Department of Homeland Security. Again, I mentioned that there is preclearance there, which means they, before they even get out of the country, uh, you know, they, they have to go through immigration. The officers are uh, charging really hefty crimes for petty errors, and, and, and we, there's no system of review. So when that happens, uh, the visa office steps back from it and they won't review, which is the way it's supposed to work. And so these people are stuck for a minor. And we're talking about students that were in America attending college. Now they've lost their travel privilege. That we need some attention to those issues in pre-clearance in the Bahamas and at the consulate office concerning an abuse of the 214B or a potential or possible abuse of 214B. And because the Bahamas relies almost entirely on their access to the United States. So if that's being inhibited, you have people that are going out of business because they can't access America to travel for, for simple things, not criminal, not security related, just simple things, but they, can, they won't review it. So we need that system down there addressed. Um, and I figured this is immigration, this is sure that's very helpful can we just sorry just because this is live stream and there are a ton of folks joining us who are not here great so um, thank you for that information. Um, you know, I was not aware uh, of these issues and how they've been how they've been mounting and growing. So it, it's it's helpful to know about that. Um, sounds like this is a you know both a Department of State and a DHS issue. So um, that's something we can take back and, and maybe um, working with Kalisha and Janae, we can get your contact information and um, and make sure you get connected to the right people here um, at DHS and State. So 
So yeah, this I, I know that uh, in my work with the State Department that there was a lot of back and forth they have with stakeholders, um, you know, in country and also here in the diaspora um, uh, for a variety of different countries. And it sounds like this may be one one issue that they need to dig in on the folks that work on Bahamas issues um, as well as as well as the CBP. So. No, and again, um, thank you for, for bringing that to our attention. So I, I will say this is the first time that it's been brought to my attention. So this is very helpful for us. So thank you so much. Is there, let's see, who has the microphone? Did she, oh, uh, let's, let's go back here to the back. Oh, oh I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm happy to chat afterwards, too. We, we want to give everybody an uh, opportunity. Yes, that, right there. And if you don't mind saying your name, too, please, that'd be helpful. Hi, I'm Aline Graham, president of Caribbean Returning Nationals Foundation. Um, we have a lot of young people that's a part of our, our organization. We serve 26 countries and territories in the Caribbean region. And when they found out I was going to be here today, they specifically wanted me to ask a question, especially um, since we are covering some of the various topics. Mm -hmm. They are excited. They want to get involved. They really, really want to get involved. They want to have an opportunity. One of the things we do is create opportunities for these young people. You three ladies, I'm listening to your stories. How do we engage these young people to really serve serve the U.S. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, um, you know, and some of some of the other affiliate countries? So again, how can we engage these young people? Let's say to help you all. <laughs> well, thank you. That's actually one of my favorite questions uh, when people are seeking to get engaged. I, you know, there's so many different ways, and again, you're you're doing what you should be doing right now is bringing it to our attention. And I, I think by connecting with the Office of Public Engagement in the White House, but there's not just that. There's also uh, on the WhiteHouse.gov page. There's uh, an engagement uh, page there where you can sign up to get specific updates. So perhaps some of the group, perhaps half of the group is interested in immigration and the other half is interested in social justice issues. We have specific pages where they can go to get um, updates for the, their specific interest as well. Um, and then we continue to do events throughout the year. And so staying connected with the, the Office of Public Engagement Office um, as we do stakeholder events focused on specific issues, that's also a great way to get involved. But the one thing I tell people is that you can look at the White House to, to get involved, but it, local, regional involvement is key. So who are you working with in your community? What organizations are, are they helping out with? Are they getting yes, involved yeah. with? And, and I, I think it's, it's really key for us to start in our own communities, but to continue to have those conversations with the White House. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will just add um, to uh, Janae's uh, comment on looking for local opportunities, uh, specifically if they're looking for uh, uh, working with new Americans and working with uh, on immigration and refugee issues. Exactly. Um, as a result of the task force on new Americans, um, the, the Center for National, um, um, a Corporation for National um, Service, mm -hmm. uh, Community Service, um, created a website called serve.gov um, slash new Americans. And it's a tool that they can plug in um, and, and key search terms and look for opportunities related to those um, areas, uh, such as helping with uh, refugee integration, working on uh, immigration issues in the local areas. And that, I think that would be a platform to kind of help narrow down the, the focus and also look for opportunities that are are not so far away. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, ladies. Great. Right. No, thank you. Um, I think we still have time for for another question. Okay, let's let's take one more question. Um, sorry, I had seen this gentleman straight ahead of me first. <laughs> sorry about that. Good evening. My name is Lyndon Johnson. I publish a care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Yeah, my name is really. <laughs> I know. Anyway, I publish a Caribbean newspaper called Care First in Los Angeles. The, uh, on June 15th, this question is about immigration. On June 15th, the Supreme Court rebuffed the Fifth Circuit Court uh, and reaffirmed the importance of federal review. Can you explain this in layman terms for, for us? Um, so, I'm sorry, you, you, which case were you talking about? Uh, I think it's immigration. It's, uh, sorry, the, the Supreme Court rebuffed the Fifth Circuit 
and reaffirm the, import, the importance of the federal court review. It's on immigration. And uh -huh. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not certain about that case. Uh, I think I have to go back and look at that. I don't know if that's related to um, uh, to review consular, consular reviewability. I'm, I'm not sure what case that is, but we can we can go back and look. There, there's been a number of, of cases that have come out in the last few weeks um, uh, because this is the, the, the Supreme Court, the end of their term, all, all the kind of big cases and decisions come out in June. Um, they, they, they haven't weighed in on DACA and DAPA, the DACA expansion and the DAPA program. Um, right now that is still stuck uh, and, and is still working its way through the Fifth Circuit. Um, the next hearing on that will be uh, on July 9th. Um, it's a hearing on our, our request for um, to reverse the preliminary injunction stopping us from implementing DACA uh, expansion and DAPA. Uh, that's what we've been focused on um, as, an, as uh, at least within DPC, we've been tracking that case very closely with our White House Counsel's Office, um, and we'll see um, where that case goes. We have time. We have time for this. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Jeanette, Felicia, and Fatima, and thank you, Kalisha, for putting together this great event. My name is Linda Dorsina Fori. I'm a state senator from Massachusetts. And so as we're talking about immigration, there's a couple things I want to thank the administration on. I am first generation Haitian American. My parents immigrated here from Haiti. So in terms of TPS, temporary protective status after the earthquake, that was fantastic. One thing that Felicia, that you did not mention outside of DACA and DAPA was the Haitian Family Reunification mm -hmm. Program um, that President Obama granted or said you know, that we are gonna work on trying to implement um, last fall, which is great. We've been working with USCIS um, in terms of Massachusetts to really kind of go through the process to notify the community as to what are the steps that are gonna be taken, although it's taken a little long, um, but we know it takes some time, so I'm grateful about that. There's one piece that I do wanna bring up and it's on the international front. Um, this is movement that's happening afoot um, not just in Massachusetts, but around the country in the United States. And this is the whole issue around the, um, the judgment that was done in the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. regarding the expulsion of Dominicans of Haitian descent. And so um, Massachusetts has the third largest population outside of ha Haiti, it's Florida, it's New York, then it's Massachusetts, then it's New Jersey. And so there's some serious concern um, in terms of these folks going back to the date of 1927, mm -hmm. using that as four generations back to look at these people who are now Dominicans, born and raised and educated in our professionals, but because, they have of, because they're of Haitian descent, whether it was a, father, a parent or a grandparent, that the government um, mm -hmm. in DDDR is now thinking of um, you know, removing these people or removing their citizenship and re regarding them as stateless. And that becomes a big concern because in terms of the country of Haiti does not have the capacity, um, I would say, to capture these 200,000 people coming into the country. But more importantly, these folks don't speak the language, right? So they're Dominicans as of right because they're born and raised there. So that's a concern because as the United States, and I'm an elected official here in the States, mm -hmm. so I'm concerned about our government. You know, what are, what are we doing? And I'm sure there's some movement to have conversations, you know, behind the scenes, whether it's the State Department and so forth. So, so that's one of the big concerns that's happening right now and would like to hear some response. Thank you. So, so thank you for mentioning ha Haitian TPS and the, and the Haitian Family Reunification Program. Those are um, programs that I've, I worked on for quite a bit to, to get implemented. And I, I really appreciate hearing the feedback that it's actually, um, it, although it's slow, it's still moving forward and that you're working with USCIS. That's really wonderful. I know that um, Leon Rodriguez um, did a video recently to help promote um, the program. So um, Haitian it, Creole. Yes, actually. exactly. Yeah, so uh, you know we, that's something that we can make sure as a follow-up that we get you all, um, everyone here in the room, uh, a link to because it is really important to be doing that outreach to get people signed up for the program. Uh, where it's really a, a test case in many ways for things that could happen in the future, right? If it works well. Um, on the Dominican issue, uh, the, the DR and, and, and that, that issue, I believe we have someone from the State Department coming later today to talk about that issue because I know it's something that um, people are, are tracking. I know I've seen some, some media attention to it um, in the last few weeks. So um, I believe Gonzalo is going to be here, uh, Gallegos, um, from the State Department. So he'll be able to address that issue. I'll, I'll right. defer to him on that. Okay, thank you so much. 
When we're at, let's see. Right here up front. I know she's <laughs> uh, Yes, right here up front in the blue dress. Thank you so very much for the gathering here this afternoon. My name is Abiba Darami, African Caribbean. I want to talk specifically with regards to the TPS for Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea Conakry. And I want to say thank you to the Obama government for allowing people to have that um, TPS. Mm -hmm. But my concern here this afternoon is that we are doing a petition for, for there to be an extension because the cutoff date was the 20th of May. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm just, just appealing if there's any way there can be an extension because most people were still frightened, mm -hmm. thinking that if they were to apply, they were going to be deported regardless of the fact that it was mentioned that they will not be deported. If there's any way that petition can be looked at and, and extended, we will appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank okay. you. Or let me ask, what is the possibility <laughs> of that petition being looked at and being extended? <laughs> well, th thank, thank you so much for, for bringing that to our attention. We, we really do appreciate that. And, and it's something that, again, all, the, all these comments that we're taking in and all, all this information, you know, it doesn't just stay with us. We're, we're going to be able to go back and share it with the appropriate offices. And so I don't know if you wanted to add on to that piece. Sure. So I know it's something that USCIS is very, very actively talking about, um, and I think there should be a decision very soon. Um, you know, we're all hopeful. Um, this is a decision that the secretary makes with his, with his discretion, so it needs to go up his chain. Um, but I know it's something that they're very much focused on. They've heard from folks on Capitol Hill, but also from the community, and, and they're looking to have a response to folks soon because we know that people are, are waiting and trying to decide and make some really important decisions. So I'm hopeful that you will like the response and that it will be coming soon. So. Thank you so much. And again, uh, Felicia, Fatima, thank you so much for your time today, too. And again, we appreciate you being here today and, and take this month to, to celebrate your heritage and to tell your story. And remember to stay involved, whether it be through the White House or in your own community. And again, thank you.